I will present you today um, OPSI. OPSI is a tool to uh, manage client in a heterogeneous environment. Uh, in modern IT, it's very common that you do not have just one operating system that does everything, but you have a multitude of operating systems that all need to be managed, and that should be managed in a uh, very efficient way. Um, OPSI is a tool to do exactly that. Um, first, who's this guy speaking to you? Um, my name is Nico Wenzelowski. Um, I'm from Germany. I would consider myself a very passionate Python developer. And I think I'm lucky enough to say that I'm doing this also as my main job and not just as a hobby. Um, I have um, uh, six years as a professional Python developer for now. Um, and my company is the company behind the tool Opsi. Um, we're based in Mainz. Um, my job there is maintaining and developing Opsi. Uh, I'm very focused on the Linux side. We also have uh, colleagues that are more focused on the Windows side, but I'm mostly the Linux guy and responsible for the server-side implementation and also uh, managing the Linux client agent. Um, and also my job involves a lot of customizing for customers uh, to adjust it obviously to their needs. Um, when I'm talking about OPSI, I first want to give you a small introduction to the tool because I think many people don't, don't know OPSI and this is why I'm talking here because I think it's a very cool tool and you should uh, take it uh, into your tool belt. Um, OPSI has uh, roots ranging back uh, way back into the 90s when there was uh, Windows for Workgroups. Um, I never worked with it, but I have, I have colleagues who, do, who did. Um, and when UEB started, uh, they were like a small software shop who focus on uh, geo information systems and system administration. And one of the customers wanted to deploy uh, Windows for Workgroups in a large environment. And this is where Opsi started. Uh, back then, these machines were already installed in an unattended method via boot P. Uh, some of you might know boot P for others that don't know boot P, uh, it's a kind of a predecessor for PXE booting. And the installation was quite simple. All you had to do was um, copy files to the new machine and uh, maybe instruct them and you're done, you could boot your system. Pretty easy compared to nowadays. Um, the, server, the server side back in the days was um, Solaris and uh, that was running with Samba already. Uh, Samba was uh, used to uh, give the clients access to the files they needed for installation. So it's been quite a while since then and uh, Opsi moved on quite a bit. Um, it gained more features for software deployment. Uh, just copying and uh, extracting files isn't nearly enough nowadays to uh, manage the system. Um, the system grew and gain more features to, to do in centralized management of clients. Um, we're, we're, we're back from um, uh, having some people running around um, and booting the clients. Uh, we now want to do is all remote. We are one point we connect to and then say, okay, deploy. The first management interface we had, um, they, they edited config files directly on the servers. That's something uh, nobody would think about today, but well, that's, that's how it was back then. Uh, the server side moved from Solaris to Debian first, and in 2004, uh, Opsi saw its first public release. Opsi was open source from the beginning, so if you knew that, that there was a company providing such, such, uh, such a system, um, you could just ask them and they would send you a CD with the source code on it. When we're looking at Opsi now, things are a little bit more modern. Um, the server is running Linux. Um, we don't just support Debian. We support a whole range of uh, systems. Um, on the server runs a web service that is uh, accessed by all the clients to communicate and, for example, see if there is any installation that needs to be done or if you're an administrator, you can check the service to see um, what software is installed or you can set something to install on a specific client or something like that. Um, we still use Samba. Samba is a reliable project for us. Um, and Samba serves the install files, just like back in the days. Uh, the management interfa interface nowadays is uh, 
Java if you want a graphical interface. If you don't, uh, there are various other options uh, like command line access. Um, but it's not, not the focus today. And uh, also the clients, uh, we also had one version of Windows we supported initially. Uh, nowadays, we support a whole range of Windows versions. And of course, since a few years, we also have uh, Linux support, which is something I really enjoy and something I'm kind of a bit proud of because the system it was initially developed to just manage Windows clients. And it was quite a road to get there to have the same code base to be ready to also manage the Linux side. So um, if you want to make uh, photos to show them, show them to your manager or something like that, um, now here are the buzzwords uh, to give you an overview of what Opsi does. Um, we still do operating system deployments. Um, we still rely on unattended installation. As I said before, we don't just support Windows, we also support Linux. And you can nowadays also uh, deploy complete images of your um, systems if this is what you fancy because an unattended installation may take you too long or is not working good enough for what you're wanting to do because maybe some software is hard to install uh, in that unattended way. Um, software deployment, yeah, that's, it's still a thing um, because just an operating system usually isn't enough if you have, want to have something working with your system. You also need uh, software on that machine. This is something that Opsi also does. Um, and if there's software, yeah, we want to configure it. So Opsi also can be used for the configuration management aspect. To make the, uh, everything complete, we also have a hardened software inventory so that we know what hardware is installed on our client and what software is installed. Um, the hardware is important mostly for the Windows side um, because if you want to deploy an operating system, you usually need uh, drivers for your systems. And the easiest way to uh, deploy the right drivers is to know what hardware is uh, inside your um, computers. Um, how does the OPSI ar architecture uh, look like? Uh, can everyone read the slides? Uh, I hope so. If, if not, they, I uploaded them to the FOSTEM page uh, yesterday, so you can uh, look along there. Um, on the upper side, um, we have some various um, clients that connect to the web service shown below. Um, there's, of course, a management interface. We have uh, an agent, so OPSI is a system that relies on an agent to work. It's not an agentless system. And uh, the upper right side, you will see uh, the boot image. Uh, the boot image is what we use to prepare a client for the installation of a rating system. So a client will boot over PXE into that boot image. Uh, the boot image will prepare, for example, uh, the hard drive, maybe create partitions or something like that. Um, and then we'll hand the installation over to an unatt unattended installer. This could be like uh, what you will find when you're setting up uh, an Ubuntu uh, through uh, an USB stick or something like that. Um, on the server side, that's the part below. Um, we have um, some backends that uh, store the data. You can rely on a file or MySQL, whatever is your liking. Um, and um, most of the things we have on the server side is written in Python, and yeah, that's where I come into play. Um, as I said before, I'm a very passionate Python developer, so I had my uh, fingers in most of the components uh, we have on the server side. To take a more uh, specific look on the server, um, as I said before, um, we have a web service that speaks JSON RPC. Um, we rely, rely heavily on uh, standards to make exchange with different systems easy. So if you know how to connect to uh, an interface via JSON RPC, um, it's, it's easy to uh, get access to the OPSI server. We still rely on Zamba. As I said before, uh, Zamba provides the, the installation files that the clients then will access during an installation. And if you want to use Opsi to deploy uh, operating systems, we usually um, have a DHCP and TFTPD uh, on the server along with a special component that we call the Opsi PXE -conf -D, um, that is used to write named files, uh, named pipes, excuse me, please. Um, these named pipes um, will then be accessed by a client that looks for uh, bootable media over PXE. And the Opsi PXE -conf -D, um, 
writes the pipe only when it's um, read. So you have uh, the situation that the client will boot with that uh, configuration that he's given only once. So if you, you can let your client to just boot over the network, and if there's nothing to do, he will just uh, continue to boot, usually starting the boot from the first hard drive or something like that. Um, but if you want to set something specific, the OpsyPXE kind of conf D takes care of that and uh, tells the client, for example, to load a specific uh, boot image, which then executes whatever the boot image does. On the client side, um, we have a multitude of clients. Um, we have a graphical uh, management interface within in Java called the config add. Um, this will run on the client side. Uh, we have the boot image I managed before. And yeah, we have that client that we are running on the systems. Um, the Opsi client agent uh, is usually registered as a service on that client and takes care of the communication between the server and the client. Um, it usually checks if work needs to be done. You can configure in various ways when it should do these checks. For example, you want to do it as startup to make sure um, when, the, when the system starts, you get a new software installed. Or there can be things like timers that uh, trigger in a regular interval um, that if the server has anything to, to um, say to the client. Um, because we are running as a service, we can also use this to trigger events from the server side. Uh, if, you, if you want to say, OK, I, I just um, found there's a um, security update, and I need to deploy this patch to all my machines, I can trigger from a server that the deployment will be done. Um, and no, there's no need for me to wait until the, the uh, client checks again at the server if there's something to be done. To make all this work, um, we have a tool called OpsiScript um, that will take care of the installation. Um, the OpsiScript reads the script describing what sh should be done from the Samba share I mentioned earlier, and then we'll execute the steps you defined. To place something on our Samba share, um, we need to pack an OPSI package. Um, this is a package that usually contains the files you want to deploy, along with the script that I mentioned earlier that uh, will do the processing where the steps are defined, what should be done. This could be as easy as just, OK, um, run that binary. Or it could be more complex uh, things like, OK, patch these files, um, uh, enter my configuration value, or something like that. If you don't want to deploy any files, so that's sure, that's fine. Um, all these parts are then later compressed into a single archive that makes it easy to distribute between different servers. And you can also have uh, easy access to various versions of your script uh, lying around. Um, the archive itself, uh, it's a compressed tar file, so still we are relying on um, open and established tools to do the things. There's no need to reinvent the wheel here. Um, the idea with these packages uh, has borrowed a lot um, from the Debian project. Um, you can define dependencies and some uh, dependencies and things like that, um, because we thought this, this is a very good, uh, good mechanism that they have established there, and um, we want to use it for our, our tools. These packages you get will then be extracted onto your server so uh, the clients can access the files uh, on the SMB share. So in, uh, usually your setup consists of uh, the place where you build your packages, you write your scripts and so on, and then can deploy to production and just by, compi by copying the file and then say, okay, install it there. Um, pretty straightforward. Um, as I mentioned before, um, there's OpsiScript. Um, OpsiScript is a language developed uh, for the Opsi project um, that focuses on the tasks that uh, an administrator may, f may uh, face when he is deploying uh, things to a client. And it could be stuff like, for example, on Windows, you want to ed edit the registry. As a Python developer, I would know what I uh, should do with Python, but I have to admit that it's uh, not the most straightforward way usually to do things. And, um, I'm glad there's, uh, there's OpsiScript for tasks like that. Um, OpsiScript um, 
has the syntax tailored to the tasks uh, that should be done, for example, the registry, um, but it's also open to re reuse uh, existing solutions. So if you have, for example, a, a batch script written that does the task you want to do and you just want to deploy to all your servers, um, yeah, sure, use Opsi and just call the external script. Um, Opsi script is also the name of the interpreter. Um, when Opsi started, the thing call, was called uh, Opsi Winst, which, which stood for Opsi Windows Installer, and there's the, the Windows heritage there. Uh, but uh, since we are also managing Linux clients with it, we felt that we should rename it to Opsi Script because it's a more general approach. So, um, as a talk description said, um, I want to look at um, how can handling Windows and Linux be done. So you've learned, a, learned about a system now. Um, I want to focus a little bit more on the tasks that may, uh, may are at hand. Um, the first thing is, is it a good idea to have um, one script to handle both worlds? Okay, I can give not get an, get, uh, give you a good answer to that. I think it depends on the tasks that lay at hand, um, on the things that you need to do. Uh, in my experience, once a package gets mature and you're not changing it that much, um, it's easier to integrate both the Linux and the Windows version into one package and then enjoy that, um, for example, your dependencies, uh, you just depend on one package and it's, uh, you don't have to think about is this, is this deploying on a Windows or Linux box, um, it just works. Um, it, of course, can be done. Um, and when you're facing a program like, for example, I took here uh, Thunderbird, um, that you want to distribute in your whole environment, um, you may face some challenges. Uh, for Windows, an installation is usually quite simple with, with Thunderbird. Uh, you have an installer for you that you can run unattended, and this works uh, from Windows XP to the current uh, Windows 10, and everything works for us. On Windows, uh, this is easy. On Linux, uh, things might get more, more complicated because, um, as you might know, Linux is not Linux. Uh, the Debian behaves uh, different from, for example, a SUSE. Um, yeah. So we may, may have the, the software we want uh, in the repositories of the dis distribution, so we can just rely on, for example, apt-get or zipper to install it. Everything's fine. Um, but then again, we have to think about, okay, the version we want to deploy, um, is that the version we require? We may have some third-party plugins that require a very specific version of that software, and the API may break in future versions. So we may want to deploy our own version. And yeah, plugins are also a thing. Um, we can deploy the software, sure. The last thing we have to do, and usually the part that takes the most time, is um, we want to configure a system. So while on Linux, most things are written into files. On Windows, we often have uh, registry entries that also change the behavior of your application. It may be configured in advance so that uh, a user just needs to start a uh, Thunderbird and then will have his mail account automatically connect to the, to the network. So to achieve that we can deploy, for example, uh, the Thunderbird various systems. Um, we should um, we, we, we should uh, check some things, and um, this is something some examples I want to show you um, how things are looking with Opsi script. Um, this is actual uh, part of an Opsi script um, to check the architecture because uh, it may be that uh, I face an architecture that I do not need to. Uh, need to support or something like that, or that I, don't, uh, that I can't support because the program I want to deploy doesn't support it. Maybe I self-compile it, it's just a binary, and it only works on a 64-bit system. Um, the bold part on the upper right, uh, that's the function get system type. Um, it will either return me uh, that it's an x68 system or it's a 64-bit system. Um, so checks to write are very easy if you are working with people who are not uh, programmers or do not have a deep understanding of how programming works. Um, for them, it's very easy to work with uh, these parts to also check uh, on what uh, system type you're running. In the same fashion, um, we, can we can then detect our operating system. 
that's important if you want to make sure that uh, the appropriate calls are made. Um, there's a function getOS uh, that will either return uh, I'm running on Linux or I'm running on Windows NT. But um, as I said earlier, Linux is not li Linux, and the same goes for Windows. Um, we have various versions of Windows nowadays running around, the latest being Windows 10. And so we may want to detect what uh, Windows release we are running on. As you might guess, there's also a function for that. Um, the get MS version info will return us the uh, AP that the Windows reports back. There's uh, something uh, um, like um, 6 free for an current Windows 8. Um, the 6 is usually the, the NT6 is the Windows underlying kernel type. And one thing we faced when uh, Windows 10 was introduced was that it first reported back from the API as uh, 6.4, but they then the Microsoft then changed it to just report back uh, a 10. And most checks that were made, um, what AP version am I on, just checked the first uh, first part. And so they thought, okay, Windows AP version 1. And uh, a lot of things broke for us. So if you want to correctly handle this, there's something like uh, compare dot separated numbers, um, where you can see uh, if you're running correctly on a Windows 10 version or if you're lying on, running on a lower version. Windows 10 also has new challenges for us. Um, Microsoft says it's one system and you, you don't uh, see any, any differences. Uh, it just works. It's will be, it will be the, the last Windows ever released. But internally, um, they have different releases. Um, and you can also check for this, uh, for this release ID with uh, the function mentioned below. Because, uh, of course, they change the underlying uh, APIs uh, between these versions. And you will need to handle that. What we have for the Windows side is, of course, there also for uh, the Linux side. Um, we can check what version we are running for, running on, uh, what, what distribution we are running on, so that we can call the appropriate tools, tools if we need to. Um, I think it's also very straightforward to understand. Um, we have a switch case in this case, um, and we just check, uh, have, do we have a Debian router or SUS, and then work accordingly to that. If you want more specific uh, information, there also is a function for that, of course. Um, that's similar to the one uh, from the Windows side, um, so that you don't have to um, learn everything from a new. When we are working with Linux and we are relying on the package manager, that's something I usually do when using Opsi. Um, something I stumble, uh, stumbled upon in the beginning quite often was uh, that there might be a package lock involved uh, if you try to ins install your packages. So um, the package manager locked the resources so no other pro process can install during that time. And yeah, um, Opsi also has ways to handle that. Um, this function also has uh, the nice um, possibility to kill the package manager if the things take too long. If I say, okay, I need to have this deployment done in like uh, 10 minutes, so I can spend uh, five minutes of that waiting for the package log, and if then nothing happens, I can just kill the package manager. It's not very nice, but you sometimes have to resort to things like that. As you have now seen uh, what is possible, um, I want to give you some best practice that we usually deploy when writing scripts that uh, should be running on different platforms. Um, first thing first, um, use the Opsi script constants like um, the script path um, to avoid hard coding paths or something like um, where, where did I install that media, put it into a variable and change it accordingly. Um, hard coding paths, even if you just think, oh, okay, I'm just writing this for Linux now, um, there may be the day when you need to change all your scripts because you hard coded that path and you nowadays want to run this on Windows. It happens. To make things easier here, the Opsi script will do an autoconversion of the slashes in the path, so you don't have to worry about uh, is this a forward slash or is it a backward slash, um, because Opsi will handle it for you. 
On the downside, one thing you can't do the, with this is you can't put slashes in file names if you want to. Okay, I'm fine with that. If you're using OPSI to manage your systems, um, it's a very good idea to use the functions OPSI provides because they usually are cross-platform. You don't have to think about what a system is running, running on and they just work. There are some special things like the, reg the registry access I men mentioned earlier. This, of course, does not, does not work on Linux, but uh, nobody expected it to. Also, it's a good thing um, to share your libraries and uh, talk with others. Um, I learned very, very much uh, with just uh, talking to people and seeing how they are handling the scripts. And this is something I think uh, everyone should do to extend their knowledge. So if you're not uh, already convinced why you should maybe use Opsi, um, Opsi works great in different environments, also environments that may not be up to today's standards. Um, you, you may face a system where you don't have a DNS. You can run Opsi uh, in multiple locations with just one management, management server. Um, that's, that's great if you, for example, have a university like this and you want to have each building um, treat, a, treat them as a whole location because maybe the science lab um, for maths requires something else like the one the biolo biologists require or something like that. Um, you can use OPSI as a ready to use solution. That's okay. Um, OPSI is very versatile. We use OPSI a lot at work. Um, we, for example, married it with uh, Jenkins to do automated testing. And part of why that's possible is the open API. And you can also extend the API with your own custom functions if you know a little bit of Python. So, what now? Um, if you're new to OPSI and you thought this wasn't so, so uninteresting what you hear today, um, I'd say just try it, have a look, um, share experiences. We have a great community of OPSI users. Um, talk to them, talk to us. Um, I'm very interested in feedback. And if you're already using OPSI, um, why not give it a try to automate OPSI a little bit more and to integrate it into your systems? This all works because of your, the open API. With that said, I want to give a small, small roadmap on what we are up to. Um, we are wanting to improve the Linux support even further. Um, the administration tools and do some cleanup and refactorings. And my personal roadmap, um, last slide so far, um, I want to move more things to Git. Uh, we started as a company using SVN and I nowadays want to go to Git and I want to improve the work with the community and maybe provide a contributor license agreement. And as my One time's up. For questions. Yeah. I would let you talk if it wasn't for the video recording. Uh, stuff. Yeah. Um, I'm still around here. If there are any questions I can't answer now. Yep. Fedora support is on the roadmap. Fedora is actually not being asked for that much, but we just recently had someone asking for it, so I will look into it. Um, for the client side, I think, or for the server side. Okay, yeah. More questions then? Thanks for your time. Thank you.